guys. Everybody give it up for Danielle. Woo! <laughs> That's a ways to get over here. Thank you guys for making that journey. I appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who have no idea who I am and just came in here to get some sleep, I'm Steve Bloom. <laughs> I'm a voice actor from Los Angeles. I've been at this for about 30 years or close to it. I can't really count anymore. Math is not one of my skills. That's one of the reasons I'm a voice actor. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I started out in anime, and I'll do that till the day I die, because I, I kind of love that whole format, and I love uh, the fans of anime, you guys are amazing. Uh, morphed into video games eventually, and now I'm doing original animation and commercials and pretty much anything else they'll hire me for. Uh, <laughs> uh, and now I just started teaching too, so that's, that's become a thing since February. I started teaching and opened up an online uh, teaching thing because I saw a lot of people getting taken advantage of who were interested in voice acting. So if you guys are inter interested in that, I have cards with me or we can talk about it at my table uh, where I'm signing. Uh, but I wanted to open this up to you guys and uh, hear your thoughts. It doesn't have to be about Cowboy Bebop. They always title these panels that. So if you have no idea what Cowboy Bebop is, cool. We'll get to your stuff too. Don't worry about it. But uh, I love Cowboy Bebop. It was the show that changed my life. Yeah. It's okay to give it up to Cowboy Bebop. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've had a really amazing career so far, but Cowboy Bebop led to Toonami, and it led to Megas XLR, and, and shows like uh, Legend of Korra even. I found out after I recorded Legend of Korra that those guys were Bebop fans. And then uh, recently, uh, it led to my relationship with Logic, the hip-hop artist, because he was a fan of the show. So, uh, thank you, Cowboy Bebop. Domeni <laughs> gato. What was that? All praise. Yes, all praise indeed. All right, so we'll just open it up to you guys and raise your hands nice and high, and Danielle will select you. Okay. Okay, um, and if I can't reach you, then I guess just talk loudly. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, we met in the uh, autograph. Yes, we did, I remember. Um, uh, I have two things. Uh, one, if you had theme songs for any of your characters, what would they be? <laughs> <laughs> theme songs for my characters, wow. Uh, oh man, that's a really hard question. Um, well, so many of the characters kind of have their own theme songs anyway. Uh, wow. Well, for, for Spike, I always think of um, Tank, I think, or uh, Ask DNA. I, just, I love that whole opening sequence from the movie. So Spike in particular, those would probably be the, the two songs that come to mind. Um, but a lot of characters kind of have their own thing going anyway. Wolverine, it's just the theme song from the show. That kind of stuff. Uh, Guillemot from Digimon would probably be something really weird. Probably be the theme to Bambi or something bizarre. It's because he loves small animals and things. I don't know. <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, and at the autograph line, I was talking to you how I made a small little clip tribute to uh, Yujin with uh, the audio from Han Hancock. Yes. I have that video ready. Do you want to uh, take a peek? Uh, let's do that back at my table because okay. I just want to keep this going because I got here a little bit late too. I want to make sure I get through everybody's questions. All right. But thank you for that. Thank you. Awesome. Or post it and I'll, and I'll retweet it. That would be even better and I can make it famous. <laughs> <laughs> Is there water? I'm going to get some water while you're finding the next person here. Stay hydrated. Not about pouring my own water. <laughs> <laughs> You're to serve. <laughs> Never be above service. That's lesson one in bloomboxstudios.com. Okay, there we go. Okay, fire away. I'm ready. Uh, what's your favorite voice line to Spike? I love the kind of woman that can kick my ass. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I do. That's true. That's actually true. <laughs> For anybody who, who knows my personal life, um, my fiance is Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, who played Julia in Cowboy Bebop. And 
she directed all the voice work in that show. And she probably could kick my ass if she really wanted to. <laughs> I'd let her. <laughs> Are you listening, honey? <laughs> I'm uh, a big fan. Thank you. I've um, just recently got into uh, Dota again, Dota 2. Oh, nice. And there's just recently the International, right? Yep. And uh, like, I was really out of date because I hadn't played in a while. And uh, they always release new heroes, right? And yep. then you voiced the new guy, right? Good too? Yes. So, yeah, that was very cool because I was like, um, like I said, I wasn't very informed and they just kind of dropped it. And I was like, man, this guy sounds so familiar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a really cool character. I don't know how much they've told you about it, so I probably can't speak too much to it. But... Uh, my son is an avid Dota player and has been for many years, and uh, I actually got to be cool in his eyes now. Yeah, so. but, um, I just want to ask about that, because um, initially when I started playing Dota, it really blew my mind how each character has, like, I don't know, at least a couple hundred lines, right? Oh, yeah. And so, is that like a really grueling process, recording all that? Uh, that wasn't too bad. Some of them are, some of them are really gnarly. Some of them were, were in there for four hours or more, uh, just doing 10 different incarnations of every line and especially if it's a character that fights a lot yeah, yeah. when you have to get electrocuted 300 different ways it, <laughs> it, it hurts after a while that one wasn't too bad and they were they were very focused they knew exactly what they wanted so I didn't have to do too many takes of each line and it was still probably hundreds and hundreds of lines I didn't count it but yeah cool and um what's it like working with like Valve they, oh, they just seem like such a cool company oh they're amazing they're actually really really cool people um they, they actually hooked my son up. They sent him to the tournament. Oh, nice. And, well, I paid for his airfare to go to the tournament. But they, but they gave him VIP passes and stuff. They were so cool, and they're so invested in uh, the player's experience. Right. They really want you guys to have a great time. And, and I respect that in any company, if mm -hmm. they're really thinking about the end user and it's not about the money. And, and uh, people at Valve have always had that uh, philosophy. So, yeah, mad respect for those guys. They're amazing. All right, cool. Thanks. Thank you. So the microphone can't reach past like this row apparently. Oh, we can we have them come up and line up? Uh, yeah. yeah. If you guys have questions, if I can have you line up in front of me here, it's probably going to be the easiest just so I don't have people like screaming across the room like, ah, I have a question. <laughs> You're really good at this. Yeah. I'm actually the voice actor. It's amazing. I was yeah. going to say. Twist, yes. Blue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is just cosplay here. It is. Exactly. Yeah. Very well done cosplay. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Yes. Uh, the first question. Uh, so Square Enix, uh, Square Enix announced like the Final Fantasy VII remaster. Yes. I was wondering when the game does eventually come up, would you reprise your role as Rinsen? And what's your thoughts about having the game like remastered? I'll have to buy a phone and call them. <laughs> uh, I uh, they haven't talked to me at all about it, and I I understand there's been some delays in production. So uh, that might be part of it, and from what I understand also, Vincent doesn't come in until later on, so I haven't gotten a call, but I've certainly made it very public that I would love to do it if they would invite me again. So yeah, I love working on all of their stuff. They're amazing and, and eye candy to look at. It's, it's awesome. So, but other than that, I don't have any information for you. I'm always the last one to know. You would know before I would. <laughs> That's, I'm not kidding. You would. You're a better fan than I am. So. <laughs> Can we even say that in this room? Wow. Uh, well, well, we know I kill Rick Toffin. Uh, probably marry Takeo and, and do the other thing <laughs> with Nikolai, just because he's full of vodka and would enjoy it. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear that today. Well, wow. all right. <laughs> hey there, Hello again. Um, Thank you. So my, my question for you is, um, in your relaxed, casual speech, you actually sound a lot like Spike. It's like you're not really doing anything. You're not making a voice. And I actually hear a lot of Spike in your speech. Nice. Is that like, was that your intention when you were voicing Spike? Was this sort of just... You played yourself in a lot of ways? Absolutely, because my real speaking voice is like this. So I, as a voice actor, I found that I could professionally just bring it down to here, and I don't have to worry about it. Um, no, this is my natural speaking voice. The, the hard part with Spike, though, Spike was actually more challenging than almost any of the other characters I played because I had to learn how to act. That was the hard part. And when people think about voice acting, they think about the voices first. In truth, it's really about the acting first. 
and I wasn't a trained actor. And so, especially in the Cowboy Bebop movie, for instance, in the scene with um, Spike in the jail cell, and he's having that conversation with Elektra, and he's, he's getting vulnerable in that place. To effectively portray that scene, I had to get vulnerable too, personally. I had to find that in myself. And it was something I had heard about actors doing before. I had never really been confronted with that because most of my characters are big and broad or creatures or you know, villains, whatever. That to me was a lot easier than actually uh, getting in touch with my own pain and talking about that. Oh, I had to feel it. Yeah, we had to get to the point almost of tears before I could effectively do that scene. And, and Mary Elizabeth was directing me at the time and taught me how to act in that moment. That's when I felt like I really learned how to act because I was willing to get vulnerable. And that was, that was a very tough thing. So um, yeah, it's, uh, that's something that's, that's widely overlooked when people are thinking about going into voice acting. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello again. It's different for every project. Uh, there are some projects, like I just did Incredibles 2, and I did a bunch of background voices for that. You'd, it would be really hard to find me in that because it's mixed in with all the other characters of it. But we worked eight hours on that. And what made it to the final cut might have been you know, two or three minutes of voices that they selected from a group of 20 people. Um, in other cases, uh, Wolverine, for example, uh, Wolverine and the X-Men, uh, episodes we would do in a four-hour session and so we'd have the full cast recording together we would we would record a 22 minute episode and take four hours to do it just so that we could get multiple takes of things and a different flavor sometimes uh, sometimes the director or the producer will give us a lot of direction which they did on Wolverine particularly since you brought that up um, Craig Kyle who is now one of the big producers for the, the uh, live-action Marvel products uh, would, he was so passionate about Wolverine and the X-Men, he would actually st he would stop production and usually they would give us a little direction from the other side of the glass. He would just run into the room at some point and he goes, you don't understand it, you don't do this right, you're gonna die, you're gonna F and die. And, he, and the veins would come up in his neck, he'd go crazy. And he, we'd just go through these really intense moments so that he could make sure that he really got what he needed from that. Um, Star Wars Rebels was like that too. Sometimes we would have a four hour session and Dave Filoni would come in and talk to us for an hour just because he wanted us to understand what this meant to the Star Wars universe, how the fans might perceive it, and, and what his angle was on all of it, and how it fit into the overarching story. Um, so, you know, it can be very quick. Sometimes they're just in a rush. Sometimes I'll, I'll do all of my lines for a session uh, in 10 minutes just because they're, they need to get me in and out, and, they, and not everybody is working together at the same time. Uh, for video games, things like Mass Effect, I would have to get through a thousand lines in four hours. Uh, so it's just boom, 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 get them through them as fast as you can. And that's one of the other things that I tell my students is that you have to be able to adapt to any situation. It's going to be different for every single project you do. Cool. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Great question. Edward. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Spike. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, uh, I forgot to do this when I was at the table earlier, uh -huh. um, No, it's all good. Um, it's all good. But uh, a lot of people um, have different um, opinions on what happened to him in the mm -hmm. final episode, and the creative team, the Japanese creative team, uh, wants it to be up to interpretation. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know what your interpretation is. Well, Watanabe-san, the creator of that show himself, uh, has had three different opinions about that. Uh, when it when it f was first released, I think he said, "No, Spike is dead." <laughs> and then he said that he went in an interview uh, after that, a couple years after that, he said, no, I, I intentionally left it open to the viewer's interpretation, which I think is the real answer for that. Um, and then I think two years ago, he said, no, Spike is alive. And so I was thinking, <laughs> okay, cool. But I can tell you from personal experience, I, I believe that Spike survived because he'd, been, he'd gone through so many things prior to that. And also, I'm with Julia now, baby. I'm very much alive and well. It's all good. <laughs> Life is good. Thank yeah, so you. thank you. Thank you for caring. <laughs> Bye, Ayn. <laughs> Hi, my, my question is actually related to that. 
Uh, so how much, in a sense, did you know the, the twist ending to Cabo Deep Open? How did you react once you, you knew what was coming up as the finale? I didn't know until the day I recorded it, and I cried. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Mary Elizabeth was directing me again at that time. We were we were good friends. Um, by the, by the end of the the series, we had done whatever twenty six episodes together, and we actually had to have a moment of silence. And and she knew, I think, probably two weeks before. Uh, they didn't even tell her till then, and she was directing the thing. Um, and she's she's a big crybaby anyway. She cries at everything. Uh, but we both kind of broke down and cried. I had no idea. I didn't see it coming. And I became very attached to that character. I couldn't believe, actually, that that was going to be the ending for it. So, yeah, it was rough. I still think about it sometimes. I haven't seen it in a long time, and I know when I watch it again, I'm going to go through all those feels again. So, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> it's okay. It's good. Did I? Did we spoil it for anybody in here? Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. You've had 20 years to catch up. Sorry. <laughs> It's still badass. You don't worry about it. Just forget about it. forget this ever happened. <laughs> Who would be your favorite character that you voiced? And also, can I have you say zero face cowboy in the camera? Sure. Uh, favorite character is a is a really rough question for me. I, I hate playing favorites. I tried it with my kids. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and and also for me, the characters are little pieces of my personality. So if I was to choose one thing, all the rest of them start arguing in my head. And it would probably just, you know, explode. Um, I can't really pick favorites. The ones that have affected my life more than any other, I would say the Spike is probably the number one that has affected my life in so many different ways. Um, but characters like Wolverine, because I was, I, uh, my first job was working in a comic book store for my grandfather and my uncle. And I remember reading comic books and hearing voices of these kinds of characters in my head. And I couldn't do them because I was a little kid. And then as an adult, I got to say, you know, you're the best there is in what you do and what you do, you know, that kind of thing. I could actually do the voice. So that was exciting. That was a sort of a breakthrough character for me. Um, and, and characters like Guillemon are, are amazing just because it was one of the first innocent characters that my kids could watch. <laughs> uh, so I, I love them all for different reasons. You know, Starscream, Orochimaru, all these different characters. I, I love them for different reasons. So, and, and what was the other thing? See, Space Cowboy? Yeah. All right, tell me when you're ready. Oh, you've been recording this whole time. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be seventy-five dollars, not joking. Uh, uh, see a space cowboy, bang. <laughs> did, did he ever say that out loud? Did he ever say that out loud, or was it just it was printed just, on the screen? Uh, only Andy ever says it out loud. That's what I thought. Okay, all right. Thank you. For that. Thank you. I knew there'd be an expert in here. <laughs> and of course, it's Vincent. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, it was awesome seeing you yesterday. So and you, awesome. thanks. Um, my first question is, I mean, I've probably been asked a million times already, but what would be like your favorite episode uh, of all of them? And, you know, whether it's like by doing the process of doing it or even just like the storyline in general. Uh, and then the second one is, how is it like working with like Shinjiro Watanabe? Oh, I never got to meet him. It was really, I missed him at, I was supposed to have lunch with him once, and I was late because I was working, and I missed it by a, about a half an hour he had to go, and I regret that every single day since. Uh, he's a genius, he's a master, and uh, he's done some of the cons also, and I would miss him at the cons, and it was, oh man, it just breaks my heart. That's, that's one of my bucket list people to meet. Um, but at, at choosing a favorite episode, also, like I said, favorites are a very difficult thing for me to do. Um, the two episodes that come to mind, and actually three episodes, would be uh, Toys in the Attic, uh, because I'm an alien fan, <laughs> and, uh, and it's also one of those episodes that we could do as a cast live, and we've actually performed that live several times because it doesn't have so many cast members that we, we can kind of handle the whole thing between the, the core cast. Uh, and uh, Mushroom Samba, just because it's so weird. <laughs> I love that one. And then uh, Pedro LeFou. Uh, just because that brings back memories for me. It's one of the most chilling uh, villains I've ever seen, and it was the one character in that show that I felt like really could kill Spike. Uh, I'm glad he didn't. Uh, and it was played by Kevin Seymour, who was one of the, the godfathers of uh, anime dubs in, uh, in the world. He, he brought a lot of shows uh, to our soil and then eventually made it out everywhere else that we dubbed uh, with a lot of love and a lot of detail. 
And uh, Kevin was a very quiet, reserved kind of guy. He was the producer of these shows. He was a writer. He did a lot of different things, a genius man. And he would just sit very quietly and direct us through tons of your favorite shows. If you look up his name, you'll see his name on a million different things. And that was the one character in all the years that I worked with him that he decided he wanted to voice and pay role Fu. And he, it was a chilling, chilling character. So that one holds a special place in my heart, too. And Kevin passed away several years ago, too. So it's another piece of my heart that uh, is attached to that very deeply. Thank, Thank you for that. Oh, man, I'm going to cry again. <laughs> this show brings up so much. Hi, how are you? Good, yourself? Very well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a clamped right now, but I'm all right. <laughs> so as a voice actor, you do so many voices and everything. Yeah. What was like that one voice that was so physically taxing on your throat or like just on your voice that at the end of the day you're like, I really wish, I, oh my God, I got to go back and do that again? Wolverine. <laughs> yeah, Wolverine hurts, and I don't have the same healing factor. <laughs> so uh, if you've seen some of the behind the scenes stuff, that we've done for the for uh, Hulk versus we did some behind the scenes stuff for that and for Wolverine and the X Men, every time Wolverine throws one of those punches and he's in a rage, I'm going. Ugh! I'm actually doing that with my body and I'm tensing up all those muscles that I would have if the claws were there. I'm I'm actually imagining the claws coming out. At the end of one of those sessions, it actually hurts across my knuckles because I, the the brain translates that physically into the body sometimes, and it feels like there's been skin ripped open and bone parted for the for the claws to come out. My whole chest and arms and back feels uh, incredibly tense. I have to get a massage after I do those sessions. And uh, Fred Tatashore, who played the Hulk, is the same way. He's a very, very physical actor. And when we were working on that, they would have us do our fight scenes together. And Fred, he's a big guy. He had really long hair at the time. He sweats even more than I do. And uh, we'd be throwing punches, and they actually had to separate our microphones because they thought we'd knock each other out. <laughs> <laughs> and we looked like idiots because we, we stay, uh, what I call a welker away, I'll explain that in a minute, from the microphone just so that we get the, the optimal sound. But the arms are flailing all over the place, and we look like idiots doing it. But when Fred would throw a punch, and he had this long hair, and he'd get all sweaty, it was like a the spray in, in slow motion of sweat <laughs> that would come across the room, and I'd just be covered in Fred sweat. And... <laughs> Because you know, he's, he's such a talented guy, I wanted his DNA. Um, that's very awkward, I know. But uh, yeah, we got very, very physical with that stuff. And, and that's one of the things that I tell my students also is it, you, you can't be afraid of looking stupid or looking weird or really investing yourself physically in it. As long as you have the technicality to stay on mic at the time, go for it. Do whatever you need to do to get that sound out authentically. And Wolverine was just one of those characters that I, I went full bore and it hurt. Uh, it would sometimes put me out of commission for a week afterwards. Yeah, it was, it was pretty rough. Yeah, and any of the characters, uh, I think there was a character in one of the, um, oh man, I can't even remember, it was one of the video games where the character uh, kind of had uh, this kind of voice. It was that, that sort of speaking voice. I think it might have been for one of the Final Fantasy things or something. And uh, I had to speak in that voice. And, you know, saying, I'm going to cut you into pieces, that kind of thing, for four hours. You just see pieces of your throat flying out. <laughs> and you just have to be really careful. So um, if you're going into voice acting, be very conscious of your instrument. And when it starts hurting, you're probably doing damage. So don't take on any roles that you can't sustain for four hours in that. And now I try to, I actually fight for our union contract so that we don't do that kind of work for more than two hours at a time. Because you can cause permanent damage. So if that's something you're getting into, be careful what you audition for, because you just might book it. I definitely looked at like taking your class online. I was like, oh my god, like that's so cool. But like thinking of all the things, like the reason, yeah, the reason I asked that question is because there's times that I try to do a voice, and I'm like, what did I just do? To yeah. Myself? I mean, doing that last voice, 15 seconds in, it starts hurting, <laughs> yeah. and I, I have no choice. I have to do it because I booked it. So that's what I'm saying. You know, be. Be very careful if you get to that audition process and you go, oh, I can do that voice, no problem. You go, ah, you know, do some uh, horrible creature. You could really hurt yourself if you book that job, so, so be very cautious. We go through all of that at bloomboxstudios.com. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, how are you? Very well. Um, my first question was just a quick one. Um, out of all the times you've worked in the booth with other actors, is there other times where, like, for some odd reason that you're all hysterical, you can't get the lines out, you're laughing, like, 
Does that need to stand out in your mind? Or? Oh, yes. Uh, John DiMaggio, who is here. <laughs> Man, that guy, I... It's, it's so hard for me to work in the same room with him because he just makes me laugh, just looking at him. He can just give me, he can just raise an eyebrow and I go, oh God, I know that there's something underneath that. But uh, he and Kevin Michael Richardson, when those two get together, they actually have to separate them most often when they put them in the studio because they are so funny that we are peeing ourselves in that room. It's ridiculous. We all try to do that. We all try to make each other laugh because it, you know, we're, we're working. It is work. But we have a lot of fun, too, and the, the best stuff happens behind the scenes. Rob Paulson talks about this all the time. Unbelievable. He's also very funny. Rob, Rob is actually a little more subdued in the booth, though. He's very funny, and he will pick his moments, and he does like these surgical jabs of comedy that you don't expect it coming, and you're just about to go up, and he'll fire one of these off just before you start doing your line. And like, oh, God. <laughs> um, but yeah, we all do that uh, all the time. I can't repeat what uh, John and <laughs> what John and Kevin Margaret Richardson do in the booth because most of it's filthy. Um, but one time when I was recording Transformers Prime, it was one of those rare moments where uh, Starscream was actually being introspective and thinking about life and 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 sort of uh, delving into his own soul. One of those quiet moments for Starscream, very very rare. And um, Darren Norris, uh, who played Knockout, was sitting next to me. And uh, he had some string cheese, and he, he pulled, pulled the thing in half, and he shoved each half up his nostrils. And so I'm doing this line, and I see something waving in, in my peripheral vision. I look over there, and he's just going back and forth trying to crack me up. And I just lost it, and I, I, just, I couldn't work for another five minutes. It was, it was bad. And I said, take that out of your damn nose. Um, yeah, but we do that kind of stuff all the time. Richard Horowitz is another one who is who is also here. If he just the twisted tunes thing. Oh my God, that guy. He, he I worked with him on Billy and Mandy, and half the time he'd be on the floor crawling around with something in his mouth, and and it was just below the um, the glass where the directors were, and it was his turn to come up to the microphone. And Chris Zimmerman, our director at the time, would go, "Okay, Richard, so on this, where's Richard? We're in go." Ha! You just pop up from underneath. It's ridiculous. We all do that. We're all a bunch of eight-year-olds in adult suits. So. Uh, just a quick second question. I don't know if you're comfortable talking about it, but you were always an advocate of, especially lately, of more like equal pay and everything for like the time you put in for video games. Yeah. I was wondering if there's anything like more awareness that you've noticed, or any form of movement in that, or not something you can talk no, about? No, there has not been movement. Um, we were fighting for a new contract, and my my focus of attention for that contract was specifically for uh, vocal stress, for trying to get written into the contract so that we could, uh, if we had to do one of those <laughs> voices, we'd only do it for two hours at a time. And by contract right now, they can keep us for four hours, and there are some parts of the contract that on specific shows, they can work them for eight hours doing that stuff. So that was my focus for this last contract. There was a financial component also, because some of these uh, games like Call of Duty and some of the other ones turned out to be billion dollar franchises, and we don't get residuals on any of that. And so we just wanted to say, you know, if it gets to be a certain point, can we get a little bit of shared profit from that sort of thing? Absolutely not, they would say no. That's something we should have negotiated many, many years ago and just didn't do it successfully. Um, so it's up to our agents to, to fight for that and to try to get something for it. Um, now we're going into a new animation contract uh, because a lot of stuff is going streaming. And once it does that, we don't get residuals either, which is up to 70% of our income. So a lot of us are, you know, we, we notice a huge change in our lifestyles because of the streaming thing and they try to sneak it through sometimes. So it, they're, they're always trying to save money, and we're almost always the first ones that they try to cut. Um, so it's, it's a constant struggle. We have to be very aware. And so I encourage people in our union to, to really be active and vote. Well, thank you for but thank you for asking. People usually don't care about that part. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm taking a look at the clock up here. We have about 10 minutes, okay. I believe. Okay. So. okay. That should be all right. Cool. Hi. Um, uh, I'm uh, quite a huge fan. I've watched all your works from like, the Amazing Spider-Man and Green Goblin, uh, and many other things. Uh, my Thank question you. is, is uh, was there any role that you were uh, given or chose that you'd expect not to like, but ended up liking a lot more than you expected to? Oh, interesting. Uh, nobody's ever asked that question before. Um, well, I don't go in with any expectation of not liking a character. And I'm, I'm also not a very good fan, so I don't know about what I'm doing before I walk into the booth. Sometimes I don't even know what I'm doing when I'm in the booth. 
so I, I try not to have expectation when I walk in there. I'm always pleasantly surprised, I think, um, especially if they give the character a lot of development. Um, you know, sometimes it's a little frustrating for us when we do these really great performances and then the animation doesn't match it because they don't have enough money to do it. I think uh, when I'm most pleasantly surprised is when they have a, a budget enough and time enough to really flesh these characters out and make them incredibly beautiful. Uh, one of the characters that I did was a Mon for Legend of Korra. And originally I didn't know much about the character. I didn't know that he was going to have a mask on most of the time. And so when I first saw that, I, I played him as a big, bold uh, villain, like the typical types of villains. And I was, I was much louder and uh, a lot more bravado. And the director, Andrea Romano, kept pulling me in. And she kept saying, no, I want him really understated. I want him believable. And he believes in what he's uh, asking of others. When he talks about equality, he really means that. And so to bring him down into this place was a very interesting adjustment for me. But it made him so chilling and uh, terrifying. Um, it made him more dangerous in that way. And the animation was so beautiful, it all supported that. Uh, I, I thought with a mask on, he wouldn't be as scary as he turned out to be because you couldn't see his facial expressions. But that actually added to the mystery of him until we got into his backstory later on. So those kinds of subtle details that happen after the fact are the things that really surprise me and, and get me really excited about a character. And thank you for loving Gobby. <laughs> <laughs> if I do that right in the microphone, I'll hurt you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I realized you're actually the Green Goblin voice, so thank you so much, because I love Spectacular Spider-Man. Oh, thank you. Uh, and um, I've always loved the Green Goblin, and I was like, yeah, well, because that's an interesting way to do it. But, so that's awesome that it's you. I thank you. Yeah, it's amazing. Good. Um, um, I have a question. I fooled you. <laughs> 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 um, I'm not for myself, and... Um, I will definitely be looking up um, your training stuff because I, I didn't know that you did that, so that's, that's awesome. Great. Um, when doing voice work, I've done a little bit, um, and or auditioned for jobs, and I noticed that one of the things was the timing difference for me. Like, whenever I would do something on camera, it's, it's you know, you have a lot more um, at your disposal with voice. It's, I realized that you have to talk slower, mm. and it was something that was a, a difficult thing because. You know, you do have to make sure you're, you're heard, particularly, in, but, but now you really have to be heard and things speak very clear. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering for you, do, how do you, does it ever sometimes feel um, artificial sometimes? Does it feel sometimes like, because again, I, I do a lot of uh, film TV where it's, mm -hmm. it feels like you're indicating, but you understand, but you have to remember that the voice is, this is what you have, this is your tool. So it has to be mm -hmm. everything that you don't have with your body, with Face, you know, mm -hmm. like that. Does it sometimes feel artificial for you, or do you feel like, you know, it's just another, it's just a different way, and you eventually find your way there? Because I, I feel that way. Well, here's here's my thoughts on that. In anime, it can become very stilted, and sometimes the anime writer will write it so that everything fits perfectly in the lips, but it's very broken up, and sometimes sentences sound like William Shatner. Uh, <laughs> because it's the only way to fit it in there, and so so that's a little disturbing for me. In uh, animation, I think that's a trap that a lot of new voice actors find is that they think they have to speak slowly because they have to enunciate every single word. The trick is really to be able to enunciate at any speed because in most cases when you're doing animation, they're on a time crunch. They only have 22 minutes to get through that and they want to get all their lines in. So they say, that's great. Now do it with all of that same intensity, um, but do it faster. Do it 30% faster. So that's when you start practicing your enunciation exercises and, you know, available for a limited time only. You participate in dealers, terms, conditions, and restrictions apply, you know, that kind of thing. You have to, you have to be able to speed everything up on command. And, and I, when I hear new actors working with monologues and things like that, many times they do slow it down because that's what some teacher told them to do. That's actually inaccurate. You don't have to do that necessarily. For some things, it calls for that. And you do have to have that clarity. You know, if you're, if you're pronouncing, if you're doing a commercial, and you have to say Toyota, and you know you have to make sure that you get that uh, particular piece of the dialogue very concise and clear. Sometimes they'll have you go super fast up to that point, and then say that very slowly, and then continue on. That's usually more in commercials than anything else. But again, they have a 30 second time frame that you have to fit all that crap into also. So you know, it's, it, you have to adjust accordingly. 
And like you said, you have to take all of your performance and condense it right into the microphone as a voice actor, and it's a different skill set. Cool. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys, we have about five minutes left. At this point, I'm going to say uh, no more else in the line. All right. No more else. So we could do a speed, speed round. How about a speed round? Speed round? We could yeah. Do. All right, let's do a speed so round. We can probably get through these people, but after that, that'll probably yeah. be. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, Hello, Steve. Hi. Uh, Bebop is, you said, was one of your earliest works, right? Yes. So something that's put on mind is, way earlier when you started off in the beginning, uh, how many times did you find yourself you had to like repeat lines over and over or redo them in comparison to like nowadays in modern era? Uh, four times. No. Um, uh, it depends. It depends on the show. It. it uh, sometimes I just can't get the words out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get stuck on the word the, and it just doesn't sound like English anymore just because you say it so many times. Again, it's a case by case basis. So uh, my training and the years doing this makes it easier, certainly. But um, uh, you know, it just it just depends on the subject matter at hand. Yeah. So. You know, it could be either you know maybe it's your skill or maybe people are just too intimidated to ask Steve to repeat a line. Uh, I don't think that's ever the case. They're paying me, so they're very happy to put me through whatever they need to. to yeah, that I means they have to pay you more. So you know. Nah, you'd be surprised, dude. You'd be very surprised. Thank you for that. Lord Vader. Yes, did, uh, did you happen to know if, uh, anything about the, how big a cultural phenomenon Metal Gear Solid was when you were cast as Vladimir Zadornov or uh, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker? I had no idea, but I got to meet David Hayter, so that's all that mattered. So my main question for you is Vladimir Zadornov is his last line, Rocket Peace. Rocket Peace. Yeah, I don't even remember what he sounded like. I don't know. It's been so long. No, it was close to your original voice. Close to my original voice, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, nice shirt. I love all the Bebop shirts, guys. I appreciate it. I got mine too, Kiri. Oh, nice. I don't remember where I got mine, but I'm wearing one too. Uh, two questions. Okay, like, one, if you could, what car does Mike relate to the most? And if you ever have a conversation with him at the bar, how would it go? <laughs> uh, I relate to his badass uh, fighting skills because I'm such a badass. Not really. <laughs> In my head, I am. Um, <laughs> I just I relate at this point to his coolness and his ability to uh, find his place of Zen when he needed to, and and that's taken years and years of meditation practice for me, uh, which I teach at BloomBlockStudios.com. Um, and what was the other question? If he went into a bar, what would his? Like, what do you, if you talk to Spike in a bar, how'd it go? Oh, hey man, what are you drinking? Scotch. Okay. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi, pleasure Hi. to meet you. I got a Bebop question. Nice. Um, even though the ending is left ambiguous, let's say if Spike woke up and was made the leader of the Red Dragon Crime Syndicate, how do you think that that would all go down? Would he try to better the organization? Would he leave them for the Bebop crew? How do you think like, he would react to that whole scenario after the, the death of Vicious? Uh, I think he'd probably go, oh man, can I just sleep? <laughs> <laughs> He's tired. He doesn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> No, I don't know. I, I, that's a, a great question. I don't know. That's that's something to be up to in your interpretation, and your your opinion would probably be more valuable than mine because I haven't seen it in so long. Thank you. See you, Space Cowboy. Hi, we met yesterday. Yes, I remember. Thanks for the autograph. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, my question is: on a daily basis, uh, how much do you find yourself uh, using your voice? For <laughs> I don't generally do that, but what I do do is when we get uh, calls from solicitors, I, I play with them. Yeah. <laughs> so I say, I, I'm sorry, I'm right in the middle of a murder right now. Can you call back? <laughs> you know, it's, you know some, something really awful, and they go, oh my god, I just wanted to sell you insurance. Click. Um, I, I don't intentionally do that because I think it, you know people can get freaked out and whatever. But Mary Elizabeth and I are ridiculous like that. We're we just can't help it. It's almost like Tourette's for us. So I, I come home after a long day and I just go ba -ba! and I just hear in the you know on the other side of the house. Ba -ba! So we we just can't help it. Yeah, we, it, it just comes out and we never know when it's happening. I just can't distinguish that anymore. <laughs> But you look amazing, dude. I know I told you this yesterday, but doesn't he look amazing? You don't see too many cosplays of this. It's so cool. Yeah. Thank you, Bounty Hunter. Oh my god, he's got the voice too. Uh, excluding roles that you've played, if you could pick any character in anything to play, who would it be? Oh man, that's a tough question. 
Uh, I used to say Batman until I met Kevin Conroy. <laughs> I went, oh no, you're my Batman. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't really think in terms of characters because if, if it's an established character already, chances are one of my friends is already playing that character. Uh, I think in terms of stuff I haven't done. So maybe just to, to do like a leading role in a Disney Pixar film or something like that, you know, DreamWorks project, that would be really fun. Just because I haven't done it, I'd love to experience that and, and work in uh, feature film stuff more. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, 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 you look amazing. Are you wearing the shoes? Uh, uh, no, I, I can get the shoes. No, I don't blame you. It hurts. Yeah. Don't do it. I'm hard to find. Yeah, don't, it don't do it. It hurts. Uh, yeah. Two quick questions. Uh, first one is, uh, who would win in a fight and a rap battle uh, between Mugen and, uh, and uh, Spike? Oh, it's, well, fight and rap battle would be Mugen, dude. <laughs> Spike can't rap. He can do a lot of things, but he can't rap. <laughs> Ask Logic. And Logic will tell you. And the second question is, uh, can I get a selfie with you real quick? Uh, let's do that at the, at the table. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's no worries. All right, bud. You look amazing, though. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Amazing cosplay. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, after 20 years, what do you think it is about Bebop that gives it such staying power that's it's such still so popular? I think it's like the perfect storm of awesome, honestly. Uh, before we even got our throats around it, it was a masterpiece. Uh, the music is insanely beautiful uh, and complicated and amazing. The cinematography is incredible. The references to uh, American pop culture, I think, is one of the things that's really sustained that uh, worldwide, too, because you didn't really see too much of that in anime before that happened. And just the quality of production was incredible. And of course the cast made a huge contribution to it. But the writing of the uh, American version of it also by Mark Handler uh, really made it palatable for an American audience. We took some chances with that and we deviated a little bit from the original Japanese to, to make it more palatable to an American uh, or worldwide. I'm in Canada, I have to include you guys. I'm, a, I'm such an idiot. Um, but to, to have a more of a worldwide uh, appeal and um, and I think that's why it holds up so well. There's just all those elements. It's Watanabe's genius, really. Yeah, thank you for that. So I'm actually being told that we need to wrap it up, so unfortunately we're probably going to have to stop there. <laughs> no! <laughs> yes or no questions, quick. Um, okay. um, when you're really watching with something like Cowboy, Be Cowboy Bebop, are you able to suspend your disbelief? Yes. <laughs> yes, I can do that. Thank you. Okay, just... I saw you get Yeah, I saw you. You can't do that. Just, just these two here. Okay, yes or no question? Uh, what is your favorite breakfast cereal? Uh, oh, oatmeal. <laughs> Close enough. Yes, oatmeal. <laughs> I do get recognized for both of those things. Do you think Cowboy Bebop could or should come back for like another season or movie? Yes, please. And hire me. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of Fan Expo Canada 2018. Join the conversation below with a comment, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.